Okay, good morning and welcome to the Blue Source webinar on renewable natural gas. We're so glad you've joined us today and we promise to make good use of your time. My name is Lizzie Aldrich. I'm the Vice President of Business Development at Blue Source and I will be moderating this webinar. Renewable natural gas has become an interesting commodity for both compliance entities like oil and gas refiners and voluntary corporations with sustainability goals. The high value of RNG, especially from manure digesters, has created a gold rush for anaerobic digester development at farms. Today, you'll hear why this type of gas is more valuable than landfill or wastewater gas for use in the California low carbon fuel standard. You'll also learn how corporations with greenhouse gas reduction goals are looking to RNG in order to take a direct role in reducing their scope one emissions. As the use of RNG has grown, the need for tracking systems and certification of the gas to ensure there is no double counting of it has developed. Today, we'll hear first from Will Overly, Vice President of Carbon Projects at Blue Source, about how RNG is created and used within the US renewable fuels markets. Next, Rachel Tirada, Director of Technical Projects at the Center for Resource Solutions, will describe the effort to create a certification for RNG used by voluntary corporates. Finally, Ben Gerber, Executive Director of the Midwest Renewable Energy Tracking System, or MRETS, will tell us about a new tracking system that traces transactions of RNG. Each spe speaker will present for about 15 minutes, and then we'll have a Q&A session. Before I begin, just a few housekeeping items. If you have a question during the session, please write the question by clicking on the Q&A icon in Zoom, and we will do our best to address all of the questions after the presentations. This webinar is being recorded, and a link to that recording will be sent out to all who registered for the webinar. Also, if you do not already receive our newsletter, which gives updates on voluntary carbon market trends and provides information about upcoming webinars, I encourage you to sign up at the bottom of our homepage at bluesource.com. And with that, we'll take it away with a description of RNG, how it's created and used in voluntary and compliance markets. Sounds good, and thanks, Lizzie. Uh, thanks, everyone, for giving us some time this morning. Uh, what I'm going to walk through is what I call our Renewable Natural Gas 102. So it's, it's going to be basic for some of you, and it's going to hopefully address some of the hot topics or the items on why you're going to buy RNG or what role, what's your purpose with your Renewable Natural Gas. So we're going to focus on a number of things and we're gonna focus on actually what is RNG and then why you'd buy for the voluntary, the pre-compliance and the compliance markets. Um, as Lizzie indicated, you know, I work with her at Blue Source and we are a developer, retailer, innovator. Um, and you can hear more about what we do. Why we have a voice at this table, uh, we've got about 25 RNG plants that we connect to voluntary buyers, we connect to utilities for green tariffs, and then we connect to about 200 CNG stations for compliance credits. Uh, we've been in the space, Blue Source has been around for two decades and specifically focused on renewable natural gas for at least the last decade plus. Um, here's a, a, you go to our website, you can kind of see our project map and see what different types of renewable or environmentally beneficial projects that we do outside of just renewable natural gas. Um, my team or part of my team, we focus, uh, you know, for those 25 projects, there's 10 of us that touch the RNG team and we're dispersed obviously because of COVID, but pre-COVID we're dispersed to about four main offices. And so um, excited to kind of get into the meat and potatoes of the presentation. So what is biogas? And, you know, it, it's very important to understand, you hear the term biogas, biomethane, RNG, What's the difference? And to just make sure we're all on the same page, let's start with a, a very fundamental concept. Um, biogas is the product from organic material decomposing in an anaerobic or a zero oxygen condition. So when you think about it, landfill, wastewater treatment, digesters from uh, food waste, manure, crop residue, they all decompose and the bugs basically create this methane content. Um, also known as biogas. Now, when that biogas gets cleaned up and conditioned um, 
through, you take out the impurities, the nitrogen, oxygen, hydrogen sulfides, some of the impurities, you now have what's called pipeline quality or biomethane. Uh, now, what's important to understand is that we in the environmental attribute space, there's a benefit, there's a credit that gets assigned to that physical molecule of gas. And that can be separated off. And in the market, we call that kind of bundled or unbundled. And so in a bundled transaction, you're buying both the physical molecule and the attribute. And then in an unbundled transaction, you're buying just the attribute, typically. And now, once that biogas or becomes biomethane and that biomethane goes into the pipe, now you have what's called renewable natural gas. And what's interesting to note is renewable natural gas doesn't have to be the same physical molecule. If you carve off the attribute at the injection point, you can reattach it at a different location. And so it goes into the, the interconnect or the commercial distribution system, and you can take it out wherever you want. Now, again, you can move the physical molecule, at the same time, um, you can carve that off and you can attach that molecule to a separate physical molecule and you have renewable natural gas. So that's what we're gonna be focusing most of our time on today. So when I think about the different demands, the market demands for renewable natural gas, there are three main areas. You've got three main types of markets. You've got the voluntary market, which has the corporates looking for ESMG, or as Lizzie said, your scope one emissions. You've got uh, kind of like an RPS equivalent. You've got a lot of utilities stepping up to the plate and saying, hey, we wanna provide our residential, our CNI, our commercial and industrial clients, renewable natural gas to purchase. You know, so you've got a number of utilities stepping up. Um, and that's what I call the voluntary. Now, some of that voluntary could actually fall into the pre-compliance market. And that's specifically as states start to look to do a RPS for renewable natural gas. And again, a, a RPS is a renewable portfolio standard, and that requires so much renewable electricity in each state, or certain states don't have any. Um, and so there's, there's a thought that there could be a mandate that states require so much renewable natural gas in their geographic location or state or province. Um, other ones are like the federal clean fuel standard in Canada. Um, folks are looking that there is regulation coming down the pipe, and so they want to be ahead of the game, and so they're going to buy RNG or take a position early to have a cheaper cost versus what the compliance cost would be. And again, the third market is going to be your compliance market. And right now, at least there's both national compliance markets and there's international compliance markets. Specifically, we'll focus today on the renewable fuel standard, the LCFS in California and Oregon, as well as the cap and trade of California. So again, I want you to think about these three main market demands so you know what you're competing against when you're going out and trying to procure RNG. Now it's important to understand, not all RNG is created equal. And so when we talk about um, different types and if I'm a corporate 500, Fortune 500 or Fortune 100 and I wanna go out and address my sustainability initiatives or I've made the pledge I want to be net zero by 2050. Well, what does that really mean and how do I get there? And so depending on what your purpose is will dictate what type of gas you should really focus in on. You know, if I'm a speculator and I want to take advantage of the upside of these attributes markets, the compliance markets, um, but I still want to be able to, to meet my own internal uh, requirements, that would kind of lead me to look at a different type of RNG. And then again, you've got the reason that so many digesters are really moving forward in the manure space is because of the compliance price and the compliance mechanism that allows these projects to be very attractive. So when I say not all RNG is created equal, it goes to the fact that each of them have different aspects to them uh, and they're, they're viewed a certain way in each kind of silo or each type of market. Now, all of the markets will have a physical heating commodity component. So that's your actual molecule, your, your CH4, your, your heating value of the gas. And again, depending on where you're at uh, geographically, you're, you're typically seeing a dollar to maybe 250 in MMBTU at current prices. So not too attractive to go out and do a project. Um, now again, that's probably not what you're paying, uh, but that's what these guys are seeing in regards to the actual value to a project itself. Now, when, I, when you look at this matrix, I kind of broke out the four main categories. I've got manure, which is going to be primarily dairy and swine. 
I've got food waste, which is going to be primarily organic uh, anaerobic digestion. I've got wastewater treatment and landfill gas. And on the left, I've got kind of the total attribute value that if someone took it uh, to the max value, this is kind of what you're seeing. So you can start to understand why you're going to look at some types of RNG over other types of RNG. So if I'm purely a voluntary buyer, I'm not going to go after and try to sort most likely, and again, most of these are general statements, um, but most likely I'm not going to go out to try to source dairy gas because the dairy market or the swine market can go and see about $84 in MMBTU. So you're talking about 40 times the price of the heating value is in the attribute. And that's because of the compliance markets. And again, we'll get into those specific compliance markets. Um, but if I'm a voluntary buyer, I'm probably not going to go out and try to hunt down a ton of dairy gas because it's going to be very pricey. And, and we'll walk through what it works out to be equivalent on a metric ton basis. Um, now, food waste, this is interesting because certain compliance markets view biogas separately based on their feedstock type. You know, so food waste is considered what I'm going to ter uh, term as a D5 credit or an advanced bio renewable natural gas. And again, it gets that because of the renewable fuel standard. And we'll talk more about that. But it might be more of a better sweet spot for a pure voluntary buyer than it would be for a compliance market. You know, so we try to put this matrix so you can start to see, OK, who am I? What is my purpose? And there we'd kind of instruct you to say, OK, I think it makes sense for you guys to go procure this type of gas based on your position in the market and what your needs are. If it's ESG purely, if it is to be a speculator, you know, again, depending on what your role is, we'd kind of dictate and, you know, uh, ab abdicate that some of this gas is going to be better suited for different types of buyers. So let's dive into the voluntary buyer. Typically, renewable natural gas is going to be used for scope one emissions. This is your fuel combustion on site of your your business, either in the boilers and your, uh, you know, if, if you're making widgets, it's going to be the fuel that is consumed on site, most likely your natural gas in a heating purpose or a smelting purpose. Now, again, you can uh, do this for company vehicles, but realistically, renewable natural gas is going to be focused on addressing your scope one emissions. And there are a number of folks already doing that, that are out there that are purchasing RNG, most either through a bundle transaction where they're buying the physical, they're buying the attribute, but also through an unbundled. What is going to be, we're going to hear from uh, Rachel at Green E as well as Ben at Emirates that have specific tracking mechanisms in place to make sure that this gas is not double counted and the Fortune 100s, Fortune 500s can feel confident that they did get what they initially intended to get. Now, as I indicated, there's a significant rise in utilities looking to procure RNG to then offer to the residential and commercial clients. Now, this is just a, a smattering of some of the most recent utilities. But what's interesting is if I'm a voluntary corporate, I'm going to have to understand that these guys, these being the utilities, can have massive appetites. You know, so if there's a 2% requirement of my uh, renewable or my natural gas to be renewable, that could be a BCF. That could be two BCF. Like this, this could swallow up a lot of the actual supply right now. And you also have to understand that sometimes utilities, they get approval through their rate bases or through their tariffs to be able to charge and to pay a much higher price than maybe a corporate might want to pay. So you just under, need to understand the landscape of, of who's out there, who's procuring, and why are prices doing what they're doing based on the market demand. Now, one thing that's important to understand, if your goal is truly just to reduce um, your footprint for an ESMG purpose, you know, you got to take it and do an apples to apples comparison. So while we said landfill gas might be, call it, you know, in the voluntary space, you might be paying all in, you know, 950 to, to 13 bucks in MMBTU for the attribute and the physical gas. You know, when you start to look and see what that really means in your actual reduction, let's say you take landfill gas and you have a 50% savings on your greenhouse gas reductions. You know, realistically, you're only carving off, you know, half of what you emitted. And when you do the math at a $10 an MMBTU price, you're spending $370 a metric ton equivalent. And so sometimes, again, we love renewable natural gas, but we just want you to have eyes wide open to understand 
what is your purpose and what are you trying to accomplish with it? Um, you know, there's other, you can go out and purchase high quality offsets for two to $12 and get that same metric ton of reduction that has third party verification for that, you know, for a much lower cost than $370. Now again, there's a lot of motivations for different buyers on why they would procure real RNG versus buying an offset, um, or just buying the attribute versus the bundle package. Um, you know, but it's just important to understand what you're looking for, and then when you try to do an apples to apples comparison, understand the economics behind it. So that's the voluntary market in regards to why buy buyers are out procuring and what type of gas they're looking at. Uh, let's focus a little bit on the pre-compliance and the compliance markets. So right now, there's a number of states that are entertaining an LCFS or a low carbon fuel standard, which is a compliance market um, in a state that doesn't have one currently. You know, So right now, Washington, Colorado, Minnesota, New York, there's actually, I'd say a handful more that are entertaining and working towards getting a, a, either a clean fuel program or a low carbon fuel standard program. And if you're a potentially an obligated party in those specific locations, geographic regions, you might start to think, okay, I know if I, I see the price curve on LCFS, that went from, you know, when we first started trading, you know, 20 bucks all the way up to the $200 price tag. Let me see if I can go out and procure RNG now in, a, in advance or in anticipation of a regulation coming into effect in these specific locations. So you're seeing that in Canada with the federal CFS, and you're seeing that in a couple of states and provinces that are walking toward these transportation requirements, as well as states that are looking to do what we call cap and trade programs. Um, now there are existing compliance programs. There is specifically a California cap and trade where you can pair renewable natural gas to, and you can lower your overall obligation. There's a federal program that is on uh, obligated parties, which are oil refineries. So gas and diesel importers, as well as producers, have to have a certain amount of renewable fuel. Luckily, renewable natural gas qualifies to actually generate the compliance mechanisms that are used to demonstrate compliance in the federal program. Um, California, Oregon, both have specific transportation related uh, regulations that require cleaner, lower emitting fuels. And uh, renewable natural gas at the, at the worst typically scores 50% better than gas and diesel. And sometimes it can be a significant negative uh, score based on which type and if you're getting avoided methane credits. So let's dive into kind of how these compliance uh, programs work. So again, we have our biogas production that goes through a conditioning scheme, it gets into the, this pathway is for renewable natural gas to compress natural gas or liquefied natural gas. Um, but this is where, you know, you get your biogas, it gets conditioned to biomethane and then it's put into the pipe. So you have your renewable natural gas and then you're pairing it to a in transportation consumer. So like Blue Source, we've got 25 production plants. We pair that to about 200 consumption sites across the country. And that allows us, that marrying of dispensing renewable natural gas allows us to create, uh, depending on where, a couple credits. First is the renewable identification number credit, the RIN credit. Uh, and again, that accounts for about uh, maybe 30% of the overall value, again, depending on which type of biogas you have, uh, but it can be meaningful. Um, and the other is if you're in a specific state that has a LCFS or a low carbon fuel standard, such as California or Oregon. And there you can double dip and you can stack and create both RIN and LCFS credits. Um, so when you look at electricity, very similar. Renewable natural gas can be taken to the pipe for use as a transportation fuel or an end use. It can also be burned in a generator or a fuel cell and can create electricity. And in states that have low carbon fuel standards or clean fuel programs, you can create credits off of electricity. So we've got uh, Blue Source has done one of the first co-digestion biogas uh, to renewable electricity to EVs, forklifts, and other electric transportation in California. So that's another way to, to create real meaningful value uh, from taking renewable natural gas and pairing it to a compliance market. So again, a couple slides just on the RIN market. Um, you know, you've seen the ramp up. Most of the demand has come on. You know, we've got 100, 
about 115 plants, uh, renewable natural gas plants now. Again, there's always more coming online, so I expect that, that number to continue to, continue to grow. Um, but it's been driven primarily by these two policies, the renewable uh, fuel standard market, as well as the low carbon fuel standard market. Just trying to whet your appetite, uh, because I know some folks know all about these programs and others, this is the very beginning. Um, you know, so trying to, trying to balance that between uh, we can definitely spend a lot more time in these specific markets, but knowing I've got two great speakers behind me and Rachel and Ben, I'll pause here and, and look forward to answering any questions you have. Uh, but thanks for, for at least the basic 102 class on renewable natural gas. Thank you so much, Will. Um, with that, we're going to move to Rachel Tirada of Center for Resource Solutions. Great. Thank you so much, Lizzie. Thank you for having me on this webinar. And it's a great group of speakers. And so I'm going to be talking about our Greeny certification program for renewable fuels. Um, and uh, if you go to the next slide. So for those of you that may or may not be familiar with the Center for Resource Solutions, we're a nonprofit organization. We've been around since 1997. And we work on advancing sustainable energy through policy and market solutions. Um, we do that in a number of ways. Um, we provide expert assistance. Uh, we do um, policy work and market development work, both domestically as well as overseas. Um, and we do a lot of education as well. Uh, we just hosted our annual Renewable Energy Markets Conference, um, but we also do a lot of webinars and best practices papers as well. We're probably best known for our Greeny certification program, which is for businesses and individuals that wanna go above and beyond government requirements to address their environmental footprint. Um, so that's known as the voluntary market. So again, above and beyond government requirements. And we have programs for um, electricity, for carbon offsets, and now we're starting a new program for renewable fuels. Next slide. So for those of you that may not know that much about Greeny certification, um, we are the global leader in clean energy certification, um, primarily in the US and Canada, but we have standards in other parts of the world as well. And at its heart, our Greeny program is really a consumer protection pro program. We wanna make sure that customers are getting what they paid for and that it's of a high environmental quality. Um, in 2019, we certified over 68 million megawatt hours in retail transactions um, for electricity purchases and rec purchases. That's enough to power over half of US households for a month, um, which is quite a bit. And there are all sorts of different ways um, that people can buy and sell renewable electricity. And we have certification options for all of them. Next slide. And how our standards are set, um, really it's the folks that are on our Green E governance board. It's an independent board um, and it's made up of a lot of environmental heavy hitters like NRDC and UCS as well as um, national, international, and regional renewable energy groups and industry stakeholders as well. So they're the ones that decide on the policies for our program. Next slide. So we started getting more and more and more stakeholders coming to us interested in renewable natural gas or biomethane. We tend to use the, the term biomethane. Um, and uh, there was enough interest there that we decided, yes, we'll move forward and create a, a standard. We did a, a needs assessment and determined that there wasn't anyone else in this space providing certification services in the U.S. and Canada, um, and that it would be helpful for us to do so. Uh, and again, it's just for the voluntary market. And so our goal here is really to accelerate the adoption of renewable fuels. We're starting with biomethane. And we want to ensure that you know, the gas is truly sustainable, meets high envir environmental quality, and that customers are protected in their purchases and their ability to make um, verified claims. Next slide. 
So we, because we're a certification body, we have a certain process that we go through, and I'll go, th I'll go through that a little bit later um, in the presentation. But we currently have um, our second draft out for stakeholder comment. And to give you a sketch of kind of what is included in that, again, our initial focus is on biomethane. We might expand that in the future to other renewable fuel types. Um, in this case, just looking at biomethane and biomethane from waste sources. So methane that would otherwise be released into the atmosphere, instead of having that released into the atmosphere, we wanna capture, capture that biogas, clean it up, inject it into a common carrier pipeline um, so that it can be used by businesses and individuals. Um, and the other thing I wanna say about that is, you know, we have a, a lot of interest from um, corporate and industrial customers. It tends to be a really attractive solution for those types of customers because there are, you know, there are all sorts of different pathways to be able to address your environmental footprint, um, including electrification. But for, for those types of customers, a lot of times for industrials, that's not really a, a viable option. So one option here is purchasing biomethane. We're looking at the US and Canada for the geographic footprint. Again, that might expand in the future as well. Um, and one of the key concepts that we are focused on is this concept of regulatory surplus. And what I mean by that is going above and beyond government requirements and compliance programs. So Will did a great job giving an overview of all the different types of you know, federal and state programs that are um, in operation or are ramping up right now, we want to make sure for our voluntary buyers that you have a true claim on all the environmental attributes, uh, that no one else can claim them, and that you're, you can really make a clear claim that's going above and beyond these compliance programs. So for example, um, no RINs or LCFS credits uh, for the same decatherm uh, would be able to be sold in a Greeny certified transaction. You might have um, a facility that has some volume that's going into the LCFS market and some volume that's going into a Greeny certified transaction. That's okay, as long as there's no double counting of within the same uh, decatherm. We do, similar to, oh, can you go back, Emily? We do have uh, an annual uh, verification um, audit, and we will also have facility level approvals that are given in reviews as well. And for all the sellers that are in our program, um, similar to our, our electricity programs, and our carbon offset programs, do an annual marketing compliance review um, and have specific disclosures that are required to be given to customers to ensure that there's no greenwashing. Uh, and then at its heart, you know, we really want to make sure there's no double counting, there's no double selling, there's no double claiming. A little bit later, you're going to hear from Ben Gerber at Emirates, and he's going to be talking about some of the tracking solutions um, for, for these markets. And I just want to name that we layer on top of tracking systems. So we, re we really like to rely on tracking system data. We don't operate a tracking system, but it's really helpful in our verification processes. So again, we layer on top of those types of systems with our certification program. Next slide. Uh, and again, you know, Will talked about a lot of different project types, and I wanted to name some of the, the specifics that we have in our second draft currently. So again, biomethane is what we're looking at now. Uh, from two sources of production, from uh, landfill gas and also digester gas. And the feedstocks that we have for anaerobic digestion that are allowed are, are listed out here. Um, so these are all waste sources. I won't go through each one individually. Will did a good job of, of that. Um, you'll notice that um, animal waste is not currently included. Uh, we intend to go through a bit more of an investigation about how to most appropriately include animal waste um, in our standard. Next slide. All right, so here's all the nitty gritty stuff. And I apologize for <laughs> this long list here. So again, we have um, 
an open stakeholder comment period going on right now that's open through the end of October. And we have a long list of questions um, that, we're, that we're asking stakeholders to get feedback on. You too are a stakeholder. If you're, if you're watching this and you are interested in this space, we always appreciate your feedback. Um, it's really helpful to us to, to create a more sort of robust standard. So some of the information we're, we're looking at is even just really basic things like definitions. How should we be defining renewable fuel certificates um, to make sure that it, it matches up with you know, how these markets um, will work? I had, I had mentioned um, you know, this concept of electrification earlier and how that's not really an option for a lot of industrial customers. There is a strong environmental push um, in some regions of the country for electrification for buildings. And so we have a number of questions for um, stakeholders about how we should treat residential customers, if they should be allowed or not. Um, and if they're allowed, are there any sorts of disclosures that would be helpful to um, provide to them from sellers? Uh, for, for feedstocks, uh, we have a number of questions about the, you know, the level of um, environmental considerations that we need to be uh, looking into related to different sources of wastewater, particularly you know, for commercial plants rather than municipal plants as well as energy crops, uh, because energy crops are not a waste source. Uh, we have some questions about that. Uh, I get a lot, I tend to get a lot of questions about confined animal feeding operations or CAFOs. Um, and there is a great environmental benefit from a greenhouse gas perspective for these types of projects. And as you saw from Will's presentation, there's a big premium right now in the LCFS market for those types of projects. Um, we want to make sure if we include these types of programs that we get it right from an environmental point of view. So we are asking stakeholders about, you know, the environmental considerations about emissions to the air, to the water, both surface and groundwater, as well as, um, as land applications as well. Um, I won't go through all the details here, but I will mention a couple more. One is carbon intensity. Um, and so, you know, as was mentioned earlier, uh, most projects in compliance markets receive a carbon intensity score. Um, in our previous draft of the standard, we left it really loose and just asked questions. Um, and the stakeholder feedback that we got based on that first round of comments is that most folks majority of folks and commenters really did want to have a carbon intensity score disclosed to customers. Um, we have additional questions in our current draft about how that should be calculated. Um, how should we take into account, you know, leakage? Should there be any sort of threshold that we need to worry about? The way the standard is currently written, um, we're just looking at, you know, that it's better than fossil natural gas. Um, as well as calculation methodologies. Uh, the feedback that we received in the first draft, there are a couple of different um, uh, calculators that are out there. One is California's GREET model um, for the LCFS program. Folks found that very helpful for the US. Um, and then the GH Genius model for Canada was also found to be useful. Um, so we're asking stakeholders, you know, what, what types of, uh, calculations would be helpful should we create our own calculator that's a bit more simplified um, and so we encourage feedback on that um, and then other than that you know vintage is always a question that we get as well there is the ability to store natural gas um, and so it's a bit of a different commodity compared to you know renewable electricity markets um, and so you know, we do have, we're intending to probably have different vintage requirements in um, our biomethane standard. Um, I won't go through, in the interest of time, I won't go through all of these, but I will um, be available for questions about that. Next slide. So what we've learned as we've, you know, gone through this process and, and also as we've launched standards in other countries around the world for the electricity market, 
is that we have found certification is really helpful in, in, in new markets. It really helps to provide a sense of trust and you know what you're getting, that it's been vetted and that uh, you can make appropriate claims. Um, I've mentioned stakeholder feedback. That really helps us and we've received more stakeholder feedback on this program than I can, I've worked at CRS for a long time, more stakeholder feedback than I can ever remember, which is great. We really appreciate your input. And then as we develop our standards, we always wanna ensure that we have really clear rules. Um, so that there's no ambiguity when you're trying to, you know, figure out how you're going to be applying the standard to your projects or purchases. But we also want it to be adaptable. And we've seen this in renewable electricity markets, even just over the past few years, there has been remarkable market transformation in the way um, deals are done, transactions are done, so many different transaction types are available now compared to even just a few years ago. We expect as the market for biomethane unfolds that we might see that you know, sort of similar transformations as well. And so we wanna make sure our standard is adaptable um, to those situations. Next slide. Now we set our standard, we have two different groups. We have an advisory group and a working group. Uh, the working group is made up of uh, a lot of the funders of our standard development process. They're also helpful as we're trying to figure out some of the you know, transaction specific information. Um, and then we have our advisory group and that's made up of a lot of environmental nonprofit organizations as well as a few industry stakeholders as well. So we have, the, we have that balance there. We did create a terms of reference document that's available on our website. Uh, it's basically a needs assessment. And then we have our draft standards. We put out two draft standards um, and we have 60 day comment periods for each. We're right in the middle of our 60 day comment period for the second draft. Ultimately, it's our independent Greeny Governance Board that makes the final decisions about our standard. And so we're expecting to have a vote on that and the launch of the official launch of the program by the end of the year. Fingers crossed. Next slide. Now, I did wanna mention sort of outside of the standard setting process, there's a totally separate process that's going on about how to do greenhouse gas accounting. So the World Resources Institute or WRI, um, they're the ones that have the, you know, the greenhouse gas protocol that most corporates follow. Um, and right now they're going through this process of how bioenergy and biofuel should be treated across all scopes. Um, and there are a number of, you know, different working groups. We're part of that working group. Um, and CRS is co-leading uh, the development of the chapter on how certificates should be treated across all scopes. Um, it is going to be a bit of a process. It's still very much in the beginning. And the expectation for the working group is that sometime next year, um, that final draft will be released. Next slide. So in terms of next steps for the Green E process, again, we have our stakeholder comment period open through October 30th. We welcome feedback. And then if you wanna know more about some of the, you know, nitty gritty specifics about some of those technical questions that we have open, I'm gonna be giving another webinar uh, next week, October 8th at 11 a.m. Pacific. I invite you to join me there. Next slide. You can always contact me uh, for questions, answers, comments, or suggestions. Thank you so much. Back to you, Lizzie. Rachel, thank you so much. That was fantastic. And lastly, we're going to hear from Ben Gerber at MRETS, and then we'll open it up to the Q&A. So be sure to put your questions in the Q&A panel as you have them. Thank you, everybody, and uh, thank you to the awesome team at Blue Source, um, Will and Lizzie, uh, uh, for for setting this up, and uh, also for for Rachel for for presenting. We seem to be on the same presentation circuit, uh, but it's great to see how how things are evolving um, uh, around this uh, around this issue. So here's a quick agenda, and um, we'll talk a little bit about what 
uh, Emirates is, but then also get into the specifics. We have some screenshots of our system. Uh, we also have a demo version of the system. And I know a few people have asked, will these slides be available? I believe they will. And we're also happy to do um, individualized training sessions on the Emirates platform and also talk just individually to people about, about what we're doing. So a little bit about uh, just Emirates from a, from a background perspective. Uh, so we uh, have a long history in the renewable energy certificate sphere. We issue about 100 million RECs a year. We're the second largest system in terms of uh, volume. We also have really taken a huge interest in innovation. We own our own technology. We have a team of six software developers that work full time on it. Uh, our RECs uh, now have the ability to obtain hourly data information. Uh, peak and off peak and we're looking at increasing the interest in um, carbon intensity so you see this idea of 24 7 renewables but also we've really moved and this is something that you hear me say a lot throughout the presentation we moved from this understanding of just gross volumetric targets being x percentage renewable uh, you know 20 by 20 uh, 25 by 2020 or, or or whatever they are from a, a state compliance but also you see that in the voluntary we want to be 100 percent renewable to a, a different idea of of decarbonization really being the push and what what is what do my activities my corporate activities my customers activities do in terms of carbon emissions and what can i do to reduce that that footprint uh interestingly emrets is is a little bit unique in the tracking sphere we're a 501c4 so we're a nonprofit. we have a stakeholder driven board we also have state regulators on our board so that gives us a unique perspective to, that, to also help implement these solutions for both the public and private sectors. And also we track in both the thermal sphere and the renewable electricity sphere in all states and provinces across North America territories. So while our name stands for Midwest Renewable Energy Tracking System, we, pr we really prefer to go by MRETs now and we, we really are not just a regional uh, uh, approach, we don't take just a regional approach, but we do take a North America wide approach to this. I think um, one of the things, and maybe that we skipped off, we, we probably should have talked about this in our planning session is really what does renewable thermal mean? And I, I even saw a question come in. Uh, and uh, so, so in terms of, of MRATs, one of the ways that we um, think about this is it, and it's a little bit interesting because these, these markets are quickly developing. And in fact, unlike Rex, where the compliance market evolved and then a voluntary market uh, uh, also started taking advantage of regulatory surplus, you have actually the voluntary market uh, moving in some cases a lot faster than the compliance markets, meaning state or required retirements or, or, or you know, a, a, an RNG RPS or required buy. And so it's, it's become interesting because usually we defer to states. However, as you heard from Rachel and CRS, there's a, a, a process underway for uh, a voluntary standard to in, in a lot of ways determine what qualifies as, as renewable thermal. Um, and, and really what we see, we started our process in terms of creating a certificate market around RNG, but there's been a ton of interest in um, both blue and green hydrogen, um, other, other renewable thermal technologies, heat pumps, waste heat recovery. And a lot of that has to do with that, that conversation that you heard Rachel bring up too about a, a beneficial electrification in areas where uh, where it's 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 not just um, uh, you know trying to figure out what we're doing with uh, replacing fossil gas with RNG, but ways to just reduce overall emissions footprints. So why use a certificate tracking system is is really a, what are what are we doing here? Um, and I think really the the big the the main reason is that having a web-based system can support the existing market. So meaning the existing um, quasi-compliance where state commissions have required uh, utilities to go out and buy RNG, which, which has happened, um, but also these new markets. And we want them to be supported in a robust manner and support not just the goals of regulators, but, but also uh, the, the general public, uh, other groups that are looking to ensure the decarbonization of our economy, verify, certify um, uh, market claims, and, and also build trust. I mean, one of the things that we know right now is that the, um, uh, the R RFS and the LCFS markets 
um, uh, you know, especially in the RFS side, there's been a long history of, of, of building trust uh, that um, uh, ha has been an issue. And, and, and I think what we're really trying to expound upon is that uh, as these multiple markets evolve, it's really important to have one source of truth. And, and within that, there's really three main uh, three main reason, and that's to, to generate certificates. So the reason you generate certificates for event double counting, but also electronic tracking systems provide a higher level of accountability and transparency. And that's really critical when you have regulators, uh, both in the voluntary and compliance markets involved. Um, and then providing regulators um, that easy to use independent uh, verification source. Um, and as they're looking at multiple markets, both RFS, LCFS, and then voluntary and compliance RNG markets, it's really critical to have that one platform, or if there are multiple platforms, interoperability uh, between them to, to help do that. And liquidity, I can't um, uh, underemphasize this enough that as these programs grow larger, we've seen this come up already in regulatory dockets that uh, a mechanism to manage holdings, effectuate transaction and maintain claims is really critical. Um, if you have a utility program and you have to hold a certain level of, of gas to serve those that have opted into the RNG program, how, how are those, um, if there's more, if there's, uh, uh, if there's more certificates or more gas the utility is holding, how, how can they sell that to recover those costs? Who pays for those fees? All these things have been issues in, in regulatory dockets and will continue to be. Uh, but I think it's important also to mention this and, and stress this, that we're not a policy decision-making body. It's been a little bit interesting and unique because we are setting in some cases um, what we think is the best path forward for the industry, including when we were involved in the, our, uh, the SB 98 docket in Oregon, not that we um, put our, 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 our policy uh, positions necessarily uh, in, in the docket, but trying to discuss with stakeholders about what's the best way to, to, to do this. And, but ultimately we always say we defer to state regulators um, and the voluntary market to say what's happening. And what we can do is control for that using technologies to make sure that uh, things don't happen that aren't supposed to be. Um, but we can, and we do that through software code, our operating procedures, a board of directors, and then stakeholder driven groups. What does an RTC look like? In the rec markets, we'll see this is very familiar. We thought that was important when you're standing up a new market, um, especially uh, one that there's a lot of overlapping players, uh, not 100% not overlap, obviously, but you want to make the, the attribute uh, fairly uh, easy to understand. And so these are all certificates have a serial number. Uh, one, uh, one RTC, what we're calling renewable thermal certificate equals one decatherm of renewable thermal energy. And what does that mean? It's uh, uh, a, 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 a renewable uh, um, a generator. So uh, it uses a feedstock that has been considered renewable to create uh, gas or RNG in this case, but, or if you have solar thermal um, uh, to create one decatherm, not to be used for electric production, because in that case it would be uh, used to create a rack. And what, what we also thought was important is that um, adding in the, the complexity of having carbon pathways. So for instance, um, each decatherm that's on a certificate could also have a carbon pathway that's been um, overseen by a third party engineer or in some cases, we anticipate that states may want to certify certain pathways and require an application process. And so that each decatherm could essentially have a, um, a, a carbon claim attached to it. And here's um, one of the things I start off earlier is some of the definition, but here's what, we're, what we are tracking um, and um, a, a little bit of, you know, uh, of what I had said before. Here's what the, the system, uh, looks like, and uh, we we are tracking both the the thermal resource, which in this case would be RNG, but then a feedstock. So we we anticipate um, that and we will have multiple different types of feedstocks that are considered renewable. Um, we've started out with a list, but we will continue to grow that um, as technology or market participants come in. The vintage is when with the gas was injected. 
Um, uh, and we require, um, in the case where you're not using an independent reporting entity or what we're calling an IRE, which is similar to the QAP process or the LCFS verifier, um, uh, that it's, it's when the, the gas was injected and then the quantity of the decatherms. And then there's um, the ability to track multiple carbon pathways if you're selling to different clients or into different markets. Um, and then there's also the opportunity uh, and the claims process. So this is what um, when you actually do a retirement in our system, there's a box that pops up um, and this is a real screenshot from our demo system that would say um, you can actually claim specific carbon pathways. There's supporting documentation with that. We handle both. Um, uh, we require that there's a redact. If you're going to redact information like we see on the LCFS, you have to provide an unredacted document and that will be visible to people with a, a regulator login. Uh, it wouldn't be uh, it wouldn't be visible to anyone um, in the chain of custody of the certificate unless they're also the generator owner. Uh, you can put in your retirement reason. We have multiple reasons uh, as well as notes. You can fill that in. Um, we have periods we are, uh, for the retirement. So year and we're also implementing the ability to put quarters because we know that some states or um, users might want to do quarterly base retirements instead of um, annual. Um, they can also select a state. And then we have uh, eligibilities uh, so uh, included within our, our IRE. Um, for example, we've been um, selected to help implement the state of Oregon's SB 98 uh, program. So um, I was talking with regulators, they could have eligibility requirements that um, to qualify for that state program, you have to meet certain requirements and, and then that the, those certificates would have an eligibility attached with them. So I think I was asked to talk a little bit about what's going on in these different markets. Um, and I know that will hit on some of this, um, uh, but even this, I, uh, I need to update this. I got the updated graphic just uh, uh, hot off the press from the, the American Gas Association, but I think there were, were, were um, uh, over 23 bills uh, introduced in um, state legislators state legislatures uh, last year, obviously COVID uh, hurt that a lot, but there's a lot of movement in various states. Um, when you get these, uh, these slides, you can actually click on, I included direct links to these different bills or articles that talk about different programs. So what's going on with Summit uh, or Ver Vermont Natural Gas in the Northeast. I think what's been really interesting to watch as these programs unfold is the differences in approaches. Uh, and I think uh, each coast, as well as the center of the country, have taken a very different approach. Obviously, in the center of the country, you have heavy ag states, a lot of uh, milk, swine production. Um, so you have a lot of gas that's being exported from those states um, to some of the coastal programs. Uh, and the Northeast is very much an electrify everything movement that um, is really against the combustion of any uh, gas, uh, even if it's renewable. And I think that has to do with there's just not as much experience with life cycle carbon accounting as you have on, on the West Coast. Now, I, this, is, this is not a scientific, uh, this is really just my personal um, take on having um, worked with different regulators and, uh, and advocates in, in different, in, in, on these different, in different states and different issues. Whereas there's a more uh, a robust experience with these full life cycle accounting approaches in, in states like Oregon, Washington, and California. So we're seeing um, more of an approach to that. Same thing with Canada, you, um, there's, uh, I, I don't wanna leave off, I mean, it's the, the AGA produces graphics so they don't include Canada, but Enbridge Fortis, um, Canada has a, a, a federal carbon plan. Um, I believe a lot of that's gonna be left up to certain provinces to implement. So we'll see that. Um, I think very similar to what you have on, uh, in North America, you'll have some of the more interior provincial uh, or, or um, uh, governments look at the availability of, of RNG as a way to decarbonize their economy. Uh, and, and so I think it, it has a really interesting um, possibility here. And, and I think um, one of the things that I, that I really wanna stress is that there's this huge tension that you see between in, in advocates um, on, on for both RNG and uh, and this electrify everything movement, and, and I really try um, not not necessarily to play referee, but but to, to mention that this is just part of the solution. I don't think, um, and I think the people that understand RNG um, aren't necessarily out there saying RNG is going to replace every decatherm of fossil gas that we currently use. 
because most of the studies, even if they're really aggressive, don't even come close to that. And even if technology gets better, but it is part of the overall transition away from fossil fuels and will be a critical piece. Um, and, and I think when you look at gas demand and the way that infrastructure gets built in this country, um, that if you're going to take a realistic view, that RNG is going to play a role in, in being a really important on-demand thermal uh, opportunity that in a lot of cases um, uh, 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 leads to reductions in carbon emissions. And I think the other thing that we see is there's a, just a lack of understanding among a lot of policymakers and, and regulators across the country and what RNG is. Sometimes when you say renewable natural gas, people look at you like you're crazy. Um, what does that mean? Um, are, are you messing with them? But uh, it, 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 so I think really defining this and then being clear about what it is will hopefully help. And, and I think that, and again, I think I try to look at data. Uh, MRATS really sees itself as a data company. And so I look at these three events um, in the MISO region and I apply them to what happened in Minnesota and, and try to, to where, where I live um, and I have for a long time that these events show that um, in the 2019 polar vortex, when I think the high was negative 30. So for those of you in the Southern states, it was very, very, very cold. Um, even for uh, us people that have lived our whole lives in the North. Uh, and uh, the, uh, the natural gas deliveries uh, actually eclipsed the overall MISO um, peak on January 30th, which was the, the, the coldest day of the 2019 polar vortex. Uh, and I think um, a, a data point that I've got from Centerpoint Energy that they've talked about publicly, that they estimated their natural gas demand for just their Minnesota customers, so about a million customers of our largest uh, IOU uh, gas utility in the state, was more than 20 gigawatts during the polar vortex. So just to, to give you some context around that, Minnesota is a top 10 state in installed renewable capacity. We have five gigawatts of installed renewables. And a, an overall state net summer capacity of energy generation is 16.9 gigawatts. So just the gas alone delivered to center point customers uh, eclipse all of the state's summer, summer peak demand um, on our hottest days. And you can see that that's echoed across MISO. It's not just uh, unique there. And so, uh, you know, even if uh, uh, um, it, what I'm saying here is that it might we electrify everything. It, crowd, it might work in certain areas. Um, however, you have a huge part of the country, the Northeast, the, the Midwest that um, are gonna need some sort of uh, uh, thermal resources that they can call on demand because when it's negative 30, you, uh, you need to have that heat go on. And so uh, I, I think what, what I'm trying to say here is that it's important to talk about RNG in, in, in terms of it's a part of the solution. It's also, I think you hear some people say, well, why would you create RNG? A lot, of, there, there is syngas um, and, and we're not saying that's a bad thing, but most of RNG is coming from waste resources. So it needs to be captured and combusted anyways. Why don't we put it to work and, and use it uh, beneficially? Uh, and then here's some of the issues and unknowns in, in market holdups. So uh, Rachel really hit on it, and this is kind of the, the issue that we've heard um, uh, really repeated across the, 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 the conference season for, for RNG. And, and I say that in a way that um, it's important is the, the reduction of carbon versus traditional um, thermal resources or, or gross volume. So one of the things we think is important is that unlike renewable electricity, whether you think wind, solar, or hydro is better, the way that it's been set up is that one megawatt hour of renewable energy is zero carbon. However, with renewable natural gas and other thermal, uh, renewable thermal resources, their, um, the, their carbon benefits are very different. And is it fair to just treat it all as zero carbon, as a scope two reduction? Um, I think that would really harm the industry and, and, and potentially stop it from uh, in its tracks. Or is it um, looking at a way, how do, we, uh, how do we achieve the same carbon reductions with different volumes of gas? I think that will allow um, companies to achieve their carbon goals uh, in, a, in, a, in a more cost uh, competitive way than having to procure equal amount of decatherms. However, the way the FTC regulates renewable energy and their green guides, they use the word renewable electricity and renewable ener energy seemingly interchangeably. And so um, the, the recovering lawyer in me wonders, you know, if I was advising a client, would I tell them that, um, you know, you got to be careful because really you're looking at a one for one. It's not clear. Um, and then 
we have this issue of regulators allowing voluntary claim stacking. You know, clearly, the um, uh, CRS is, is unlikely to do that. Um, you know, will will states do that? Um, I personally don't um, like the idea of stacking the voluntary claims with with those, like you can with the RFS and LCFS. But if a state required it, it might be something we would still implement. Well, we would implement it to help them, but be very clear in in the certificates that the same. Uh, you know, volume is subject to an existing compliance scheme um, and be very clear about that because really the whole idea behind these systems are to prevent double counting. We want to do that. Um, and then uh, we heard this brought up the carbon offset natural gas or Kong. It might be a cheaper way to reduce your emissions. I, and again, when I talk to customers, uh, CNIs, I don't necessarily get the feeling that people want to do that. I think, yes, it might be cheaper, but um, you know, it's, it's, Kind of why you still have a whole swath of people that, um, well, they uh, understand they emit a lot when they get on an airplane. They don't want to necessarily plant trees to offset the emissions from the airline. They want to see a similarity between the offsetting, um, what, what they're offsetting, and what they're what, what they're emit, why they're emitting. And um, again, that's not to say that carbon offset natural gas is a bad thing. I just see it. Um, uh, you know, but it is a risk. I think if Kong, um, as they're calling it, really does take off, it could be a huge threat to RNG. And then as any of these markets grow, data standardization, we're seeing that in electricity, we're really far behind in our need for data standards. So one of the things we've been promoting kind of more behind the scenes is that as these industries grow, the, the interest in sharing pipeline information, injection data, streamlining it, putting in um, standards will be really critical. And then just a little bit more about MRETs, and I think it's uh, probably time to jump into Q&A. Thank you so much, Ben. Um, and thanks to all of our presenters. That, that was a fantastic overview. It is a complicated subject. We've got um, a lot to cover with regards to both voluntary and compliance markets. But we have about 14 minutes, and I would love to use that time to address some of the questions that have come in. If you do have a question, feel free to put it in the Q&A. We'll probably have time to get to it. Um, so I wanna start with a few of those that have come in. Um, there is a question for Will, and the question is, RNG volumes in California um, under the LCFS have been slowly increasing in recent years, but still represent a relatively small portion of the credits, the overall credits under the LCFS program. Do you have an idea of when we might see RNG deliveries to the state really ramp up? And do you think the LCFS price cap installed this year, which for those of you who don't know, it's about $217 per metric ton. And may that hamper the economic viability of RNG projects going forward? You know, that's a, that's a good question. Um, I think where I'd start with is, you know, holistically, at least right now, what's being reported in EPA for the RFS, we're doing about 115,000 MMBTU a day. And if you look at California's total natural gas consumption, it's close to about 65,000, 70,000 MMBTU a day. Obviously, COVID is, is taking a number, a turn on it. You know, so we'll see kind of where 2020 lands. When you look at 2019's LCFS credit generation, um, we actually had about 6% of the total credits generated. And again, that's, that's because, you know, the size of pie, I mean, this year, federally, nationally, we'll do about 500 million gallons of fuel. And so when you think about, you know, let's say half of that, you know, so we maybe did 250, 260 million gallons in California. And most of that, I'd say 90% of that last year was going to be a landfill gas CI um, versus like a negative dairy gas. Now, there are, you know, a number of registered approved flowing negative dairy gas projects. But volumetrically, at least right now, that's going to be primarily met with landfill gas going into California. And so, you know, 6% is what we did in 2019. Will that grow? Yes. But you're going against 13 billion gallons of, of gasoline, carbob, that's going to have a billion gallons of ethanol blended. You know, so just volumetrically, it's, it's 4x at least, you know, the size um, on ethanol. When you think about diesel, we could go another 3 billion gallons, you know, that looks like it's going to get paired with renewable diesel uh, as the, the drop-in fuel. And so um, is $200 a strong price? Yes. You know, some folks were forecasting out, you know, 20 or $250 for 2026. 
I'd be very cautious because of some of these game changer announcements in the other fuel space. Um, you know, with some of the projections, when you think about it, you know, Phillips 66, Marathon, both have made announcements where they're, and they're just one of eight other R uh, renewable diesel plants going, um, you know, and it, again, it's because of the economics from the LCFS. And so you, you got to start to watch, okay, that 3 billion gallons of diesel, which is a deficit creator, will now become a credit generator, you know, and you're going to see a 30 or 40 CI. So you're going to see a, a dearth of credits come onto the market come 2025. Uh, and so, um, you know, will we get, stay near that cap? Uh, I think we will for the next couple of years, but then once you start to have a lot more of supply come on, I think we actually could be, you know, oversupplied with credits. And so we'll see some price fall off in the back half of, of this program. Um, it, it, the program is doing what it's intended to do, which is to drive real change. And when you've got large oil obligated parties converting their refineries, uh, you know, ARB is going to say that they're going to try to cl take claim for that. And I could see them extending the program and ratcheting up the, the percentage even higher. So um, I know that maybe hit one of the questions on RNG and the price cap, uh, you know, but how much will go to California? And again, we do a lot of analytics on what's going into California, what's outside of California, you know, so it might be a follow-up question that we could definitely answer, if that'd be helpful. Thank you. Thanks, Will. Um, and I did want to ask you, Will, just as a follow-up on that, as we've seen this gold rush for manure digesters in California due to the LCFS value, um, if, if there is a project developer looking to um, install uh, some type of system that would allow for the capture of gas from a landfill or a wastewater treatment plant, should they factor LCFS proceeds in their pro forma? Or is it such that uh, they won't be able to get their gas into the California market because the negative CI gas from manure digesters is going to beat out that higher CI gas from other sources? Yeah, I mean, not to say um, that it's not possible, but I would not plan on it. You know, if you're not an existing flowing project uh, that is already in operation and that is close to having a CI score, then I, I probably wouldn't plan on dislodging the existing RNG that's going into California. Um, and again, just as a comparison, Minnesota, uh, New York, Colorado, Oregon, you actually need those four states plus another Minnesota to get to the same size as California. So while there's a number of LCFS programs coming on, they're just, they're very small compared to California's overall size of the program. And so a lot of that vehicle fuel that's being dispensed is already being paired. I'd say where you could have opportunity, um, you know, is gonna be more on the creative side, more on the, the hydrogen side, maybe even to the refinery side, um, you know, and so that, that definitely could have a lot of opportunity but actually going to a CNG dispenser, I would not plan on it. Um, now, could you find your way in there potentially, but I would not uh, put it into my pro forma as a have to be in, so. Thanks, Will, great. This is a question for Rachel and Ben, and I think it's a good one for those who may be new to the topic. What is the relationship between MRET's validation and the Greeny certification for RNG attributes? Yeah, uh, I can, um, I, I like to say, and I say this lovingly, that the CRS, Rachel's heard me say this before, are kind of the police around the claims, making sure that you're following a set of rules and then they also sign off on them. There's an audit. We are a means to help get there. So we create the certificates, we track the generation, um, and then we also manage and make sure that there's a way to audit claims. And But we are not an auditing body and we don't certify that something... Um, uh, met a certain uh, um, set of set of rules, except our own, to become generation. Maybe Rachel, I don't know if you have any thoughts. I hope I didn't muddy that. No, that was that was great, Ben. So again, we set the standard for what would count um, for biomethane sales, um, and then we also do marking compliance review that's done outside of the tracking system. As Ben said, we um, do claims reviews, and we would have our sep own separate. Um, procedures that all the auditors need to go through for transactions as well as facility level reviews. So again, we layer on top of 
um, tracking systems. We do the same thing in the electricity space. So there are a number of different renewable electricity tracking systems. Um, most of them are regionally based within the US and Canada. Um, and on the electricity side, we require the use of those tracking systems except in limited circumstances. Um, and so we like tracking systems, um, they really help with data validation. And then we do a lot of checking outside of that in addition to um, checking with the regulators. So for example, in the, in the electricity space, about a third of US states have some special something in our standard or in our procedures outside of the tracking systems that needs to take place. Um, and so if the tracking system is not set up to do that type of validation, we do it outside of the tracking system. Great, great, thank you for that. Um, there was a question that says, keeping in mind that this uh, market is in its infancy, are most RNG transactions bespoke, highly customized deals, or is there a standardization forming that can enable more general trading on an exchange? And Will, you may be able to speak to that best. Yeah, I mean, I'd say right now, most of this is over the counter. There have been a number of entities that are working on a platform or an exchange where you can just go and, and procure RNG. And I think the concept is great. Um, and I know of a couple of entities that are working on that. Um, I don't know if we're there yet, you know, and, and again, folks are wanting to get there. Um, so the appetite, the interest is there, but at least right now, it's most likely gonna be kind of a, a nuanced, you know, and again, depends on what your needs are too. We've got some voluntary buyers, <clears throat> depends on who you are. Are you a voluntary corporate? Are you a voluntary utility? Are you in that pre-compliance space? Are you in the compliance? So again, depending on what you're looking for, we kind of dictate what uh, type of transaction you're probably going to be going forward with. And we've spoken, there are companies that are looking at building, it's in the rec space as well, building spot market tools. Uh, I think really the, the bigger problem has been, can they get the volume to justify the, the cost of, of those tools? Um, we support it. We offer our system. We don't charge for an API. So we're hoping that people will come and build tools. Uh, we, we view our role very strictly as being a registry and not, and not developing those on our own and, and putting those resources back into the registry. But um, it's definitely a business opportunity. And I think with the price of, of um, RNG and things like that and the LCFS, it's only a matter of time before uh, somebody comes up with something. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thanks. I want to ask a question. I think this might be best directed at Will. I am working with a number of voluntary buyers often hear this misperception that, well, methane is 25 times as potent as CO2 on a ton for ton basis. Um, and of course, that depends on the time scale you're looking at. But so if we were to use RNG, aren't we going to make reductions 25 times that? Um, and so I just wanted to, to put that out there because it really depends on the carbon intensity of that um, RNG. Will, would you like to speak to that with regards to um, the carbon intensity associated and how that transfers into greenhouse gas reductions? Yeah, and I might, I might screen share again and just kind of show um, one thing. Okay. So, you know, e EPA, EIA all uses factors for amount of CO2 per MMBTU, you know, and so right now we're using kind of EPA's factor of 116. Um, and so that's assuming fossil uh, natural gas. And so, you know, you're right, methane is 25 times heat capturing, um, you know, but we, we take it to the CO2 equivalent. So you can kind of figure out, you can get apples to apples and you can actually compare, um, you know, one, one thing against another thing. And so um, that's kind of already taken into account. And now again, if, if you're, let's say fossil fuel, at least how GREET models it is around 79. And again, that's taking it from, from wells to wheels. Um, you might not have the, the same combustion efficiency as a vehicle, depending on what you're destroying your RNG in. So yours might be a little tweaked here in regards to when you look at the whole life cycle assessments of your um, gas. And so I was, I'm speaking more in generalities, you know, but let's say you're a score of 80 for fossil fuel and your landfill comes in at a 40 CI. Well, you're approximately 50% 
uh, better than where you were, you know? And so you can kind of, you can do the quick math. Now, again, obviously, if you want to do your own LCA and figure out, you know, your efficiency of your boilers, by all means, that's something that we do um, and know very well in and out, um, you know, but it, it really just depends on your specific application, um, you know, but your CI score, typically you can at least understand, okay, I'm 50% better. Oh, I'm 100% better because I'm a zero CI. You know, then, oh, actually I'm, I'm net negative. And so I'm, I'm, I, I need to buy less. You know, I don't have to buy an MMBTU per MMBTU. I can actually buy less because I'm, I'm covering more than what I actually would do with a negative score. So I think it, it kind of just really depends on your application, but um, that's why I'd say, hey, look, we use common factors across the board. And those are typically, you know, standards set by EPA or EIA, uh, depending on which one you use. Thanks, Will. That really helps. A couple of questions about applicability of um, what qualifies for RNG. There was a question about uh, wood waste uh, and creation of syngas from it be recognized as RNG. There was also a question about whether or not municipal solid waste is considered a renewable feedstock. Um, so I'll, I'll let you all, whoever feels best uh, suited to answer those, answer them. Yeah, so I think one of the... Uh, oh, sorry. I can take that, uh, yeah. Lizzie. So we asked stakeholders about this very question, these very questions in our stakeholder come up period for the first draft. Um, so for wood waste, um, there's a process to go through called gasification that creates syngas. Um, and we asked stakeholders about that. And so because you're not, um, you're sort of creating a new gas rather than capturing a gas that would otherwise be emitted into the atmosphere. Um, the, the feedback that we got was, at least for our initial round for the voluntary market, to not include gasification um, at this point. We might consider that in the future. Um, there are certain states that are looking into that as um, a potential for biomethane, such as, as California. For municipal solid waste, um, we we're going to be allowing um, municipal solid waste when it's within a landfill. Um, and then, you know, not, not in a digester situation. So for anaerobic digestion, it's not really um, the greatest idea to put just unsorted MSW into an anaerobic digester. Um, one of the things about that is what comes out the other end. So after you've done this uh, process of anaerobic digestion and you've captured all the biogas, cleaned it up, biomethane, what you're left over with is um, something called digestate. Um, and what you do with that digestate um, can be important. It can be a, a helpful fertilizer um, in some, some instances. So you don't want to have a bunch of other junk in there that's going to that's gonna be not helpful for, um, for fertilizer. So we have some questions for stakeholders as well about how to treat that digestate in different situations. And I think one of the difference between MRETs and CRS is we might uh, we might track that. I don't think we would track, um, you know, some states consider MSW or, you know, trash combustion um, renewable. Uh, and I know actually one case there is some combined heat power that utilizes that in a closed loop facility uh, actually to heat like a light rail tracks um, and sidewalks. You know, would somebody buy that and, and you buy the right to make a claim on that and, and, use it. I mean, I think that's really where the difference between tracking and certification come in and, and, and then the, just the general market ethics and, and how this evolves. Um, but yeah, I think we said we've been open to it, but it would need to be very clear that that's what it is. And, and if it created any inconsistencies in the market, then we would really stop that. Thank you. The only thing I'd add is, so in the RFS and the compliance market, um, you know, the definition of renewable biomass uh, you know, technically separated yard waste, food waste, and separated municipal solid waste falls into that definition. And so when you look at the chart, you can create a D3 or a cellulosic biogas credit from uh, separated MSW. Uh, so far, a lot of, uh, there's a lot more added regulation on the MSW, separated MSW, than there is biogas. And so um, I not to say that there isn't someone doing it, but that's not the common pathway for, for folks to create credits. So uh, yes, you can create RINs, specifically D3 RINs from separated MSW. 
Um, but as Rachel pointed out, there are some uh, nuances to it. So. Thanks everybody for that. And I know we're a few minutes over, but I'm gonna to try to get two last questions in. Um, there was a question about what might drive a supplier of RNG to explore the voluntary market versus compliance market. So, um, Will, do you wanna to speak to that? Yeah, and I'll share my screen again, just so everyone's looking at the same thing. There's a question on why we had NAs. Uh, First, I'll answer that one. You know, someone could totally, a voluntary buyer could go buy dairy gas. Um, when you think about it, you know, if I used a $10 uh, landfill gas price, and now this is called it on the spot market eight times that, you know, you'd be spending almost $3,200 a metric ton. And so that's why I just put NA is, could you do it? Totally. But does it seem practical probably not you know and that's kind of why we put some of these other things as kind of an na could you do it yeah but there's not a ton of folks that just wanted to block up their dispensing capacity to get a d5 because there's a big value delta um, and unless you're going to hydrogen you're probably not going to get in um, you know and so there's there's specific reasons why things would go where now again the question that you just asked is if i'm a voluntary buyer you know, where, where am I going to look at? Is that the question, Lizzie? Just to make sure I understand. Actually, the, the question is more from the producer standpoint. If you're producing RNG, are you going to sell into the, the compliance market or the voluntary market? We know that the prices fluctuate in both. Um, but where would you choose to place your gas based on um, that? And I, th I think you really did answer that well. I think, you know, the value of D5 gas that we're seeing right now is about $10 per MMBTU. If your gas can qualify for a D3 REN or if it has a very low carbon intensity score, you're clearly going to try to get that into the California market and you're going to sell D3 RENs from it. Um, most voluntary clients that are buying RNG are buying D5 gas because that has and it, gas that can't get placed into California because it has the least value in compliance markets. It's just very difficult for the gas to compete. Um, when it has such a high value in those compliance markets. And then the other big thing is as a producer, what's your finance require? You know, finance probably wants long-term guarantee, you know, so they want a 10, 15 year offtake. So you're going to lock in with a, a buyer, a fortune, you know, 100, fortune 500, a university, a utility, who's going to be credit worthy. So you're going to take a lower price, you know, but you might not do that on all your volume. And you might, again, we're at a, a medium to strong price right now. You know, last year in the summer, we hit 50, 60 cents on the D3. So this is a volatile market. Um, next year, we're gonna get a, we're at least getting a 43 cent bump on the cellulosic waiver credit. You know, so I can see prices go up another, you know, 50, 60 cents on the RIN for next year. Uh, and again, uh, there's a lot that still needs to be, you know, provided guidance from EPA. Um, specifically on the 2021 RVO, you know, but we're pretty bullish on the market just with the supply projections, with the SREs coming out, uh, being rejected, or majority of them being rejected, you know, and a very strong say loss of waiver credit price. So again, you want the upside, but you got to got to satisfy your finance uh, and fi finance might require a long term offtake. So it just really depends. Great, great. And then last question, how do you see the trend in electrification of EVs and fleets impacting demand for RENs and RNG? And just for the folks on the line, just so you know, there has been an application to the EPA for e-RENs or RENs that would be generated for um, electric vehicle charging. The EPA has yet to review that application and provide um, a response on it. Uh, but there could in the future be e-RENs available that could um, provide additional incentive throughout the nation. But um, I'll, I'll pose that to the group. Yeah, so I'll be quick. I think, Lizzie, one of the things that we, uh, we see, and you probably see this at all these events, is that you know, people are like, this is a gold rush. It's amazing. But these things only last for so long. I started my career in North Dakota in the oil patch 2010, and people are like, oil will never be below the cost of production ever again. This is here to stay and things change. And so I think this is uh, a reason that if you're, there's a potential to, to offset or, or, or hedge some of your pricing, that's, yeah, you're gonna get a lower price. We've heard that from, from people say, why would I take a lower price? Well, you're locking into 10 year rates. 
um, uh, yeah, uh, you know, and yes, prices might change and go lower, but uh, right now um, you, you'll have to get that, that saving. So I, I think that's just briefly what, what I would say is that, um, you know, I doubt that very few generators, low CI are gonna sell all their gas into voluntary, but it's a, a way to hedge. Right. Yeah, I mean, obviously, California just made a, a huge announcement, you know, on, on 2035, you know, no, no gas vehicles. And, and so the industry, the renewable natural gas industry is, you know, trying to figure out what's that mean for us specific, you know, obviously, we need compressed natural gas, we need liquefied natural gas to be able to place the RNG into the transport market. Um, you know, and so again, it's, is it going to have an impact? Yeah, I think it's going to impact more the 13 billion gallons of, of, of gasoline consumed in California than it is the, let's call it, um, the typical closed loop, the transit agencies. I mean, now again, yes, lots of transit agencies moving over to EV. Fully appreciate that, you know, but the, the closed loop trash trucks, the, um, you think about those, the long haul, the heavy duty, that I think still has a plenty of room for RNG to play. Um, you know, and so I think, I think you'll see uh, growth continue in this space because of these incentives. And great. I think I'll just add is, you know, with this climate crisis, there's plenty of room for everyone. We're very supportive of electrification. We're in an all hands on deck moment right now. So we're very supportive of any, you know, any paths that we can get. Uh, to to move forward and, and solve this climate crisis we're, we're supportive of. So uh, we think the, there will be room for all of these solutions and, and markets. Um, prices may fluctuate, uh, but, but uh, you know, we'll see. We'll see how it unfolds. Great. Well, I want to just thank all of our panelists today. You did a great job with complex and emerging markets and um, thanks to all the listeners who joined us. Uh, feel free to reach out to us if you have questions that were uh, not answered or questions that come up later. And feel free to check out bluesource.com for our upcoming webinars and newsletters. And um, we'd love to be in touch with you if we can help illuminate anything about these, these very nascent markets for you. So thanks again, and everyone have a great day. Thank you.